So, uh, hello and welcome, everyone, to the first uh, RF Venue weekly webinar. Uh, we're going to be doing a weekly series, so uh, looking forward to diving in. So, um, without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to uh, my co-host here um, and presenter, Don Boomer, Senior Applications Engineer from RF Venue. John? So, today what we're going to talk about is why uh, wireless microphones drop out. So let me preface this a little bit. This is, uh, we're, we're gonna be talking about why they drop out after you have your system set up. So we're going to assume that you have your, your wireless mics all wired up, uh, your antennas are connected, you've used a coordinating program or some other way to pick your channels, your system is all set up, ready to go, and now it's showtime, and uh, all of a sudden you start suffering from uh, dropouts. Why are they happening? The most common reason that wireless microphones drop out are these three points here. The range, if you start getting multipath, which uh, undoubtedly you're getting all the time, and the polarization of your antennas. Now, I have to also preface this and say, I do have to speak in general terms. There are some small exceptions. Uh, I realize we have folks all over the world. We have a little different frequency bands, but uh, you know, 99% of the time, I think what we'll be presenting here will be what you're up against. Okay, so the, uh, the first problem is range. You've gotta be able to get from here to there. What that's really all about is your receiver's ability to pick up a usable signal. So you've got a transmitter and you've got a receiver. If you're working with fairly modern equipment, most of this stuff now is awfully good. If you're working with 10 year old radios that were inexpensive, obviously they're not as good and expensive radios are better, but uh, the transmit range of a wireless microphone in the UHF TV band here in the US. Most, most manufacturers have a spec that they call 300 feet. Frankly, it'll go three or four times that far. Frankly, it's going you know all the way from, from here to thousands of miles uh, at a very, very, very weak. So you have to have a receiver, of course, that can receive a weak signal. But what you have to have is a usable signal. And so, you know, if we're standing out in the middle of a, a cornfield in Indiana, frankly, your wireless mic may do a quarter of a mile. It'll go a long way. The problem that we run up against is interference. And when we have interference to our signal, even though the transmitter is making it to the receiver, it's having to compete with too many other things. And that's why your range drops out. Now, usually the way people are using wireless microphones, 50 feet, 100 feet, not a problem. You, you have plenty of range, you have plenty of power, but what, what you may not have is control over your interference. And that is a problem. And here in the US, here's a new one. I'm sure you've all seen these uh, for the T-Mobile 71 band cell phone service. It's 5G, it's 4G, it's all at the same time. Frankly, it's been on in a lot of places in the United States for about three years, but there just haven't been very many cell phones that worked with it. So almost nobody that you've run into has been working on this band. However, since Apple released iPhone 11 a few months back and probably sold millions of them, anybody that is on T-Mobile and has an iPhone 11 is now uh, has a transmitter that is operating very close to US 470 to 608 range. This will vary in other countries, so you, you may have to check. So what your usable signal is really called is CNR, is carrier to noise ratio. It's like signal to noise ratio, if you're more familiar in the audio world. But it's carrier. So it's the strength of your transmitter compared to the local noise. With digital wireless, it's that, but it's also BER, which is bit air rate. So digital wireless microphone systems are usually capable of losing a little bit of information, but being able to reconstruct it or find their way around it. The idea is you have to get your signal to your receiver high enough above the noise floor 
so that your receiver chooses your transmitter, your intended transmitter, instead of any other local interference that might be going on around you. Usually a safe number, and again, this depends on everything, but a safe number is about 20 dB. If you can get your carrier signal 20 dB above your noise floor, it's very likely that your radio will lock to that, and then at that point, it pretty much stops seeing the noise, unless the noise should get quite a bit higher in amplitude. So a couple of things that you can do to improve this. The first one is get your transmitter closer to your antennas. So again, probably a lot of you are more familiar with audio. Uh, you know about speaker distance and inverse square law. Well, the same thing corresponds to radio signals. Every time we cut the distance in half, we can improve the carrier to noise ratio about 6 dB, provided you know the noise isn't like right next to your radio. But generally speaking, we can make your signal stronger compared to the noise. The noise won't change much, but the signal strength will get much, much better. So if you have your antennas back at front of house and you're 100 feet in the back, if you were to move your antennas up on stage, you could improve your signal something on the order of 12 dB and the noise floor wouldn't really change. We always wanna get our antennas reasonably close to our transmitters. Of course, it's possible to get it too close. You, don't, you need to be six or 10 feet away from an antenna, generally speaking. You don't wanna put a transmitter on top of an antenna. That's gonna cause all kinds of problems, but why would you do that? Another thing that you can do is you can add bandpass filters. This is a product that we make, these little bandpass filters. You can see they're pretty tiny. They've just got a BNC connector on each side. They're passive. And basically, they block out-of-band information. That's what the T-Mobile thing is in the United States. That's a little bit on the top end of the band. On the bottom end of the band, you have interference from LED lighting, uh, video walls, garage door openers. There's a bunch of stuff at the bottom end of the band. So if you look, this is what, uh, when you insert these filters into your antenna line, going into your distro, going into your receiver, you get band passes. So what we're doing with these filters, we're blocking out of band noise. Now you can't block the in band noise because you need to be able to receive in those areas, but we can block RF energy that's above and below the frequencies we need with these little filters. So, Here's what happens if I drop this filter onto my antenna, the, the top of that uh, scan there, you can see a lot of out-of-band information that's not of any interest to me, it's just getting in my way. At the bottom, you can see what happens when I put that filter in. I pretty well just crush all that extra information up at the top there, in this case where T-Mobile's sitting. If, we, if this graph extended, you'd see it would cut the bottom as well. So it's pretty easy to see that we blocked a lot of RF information that we're not interested in. But maybe what you're not seeing right away is that we've also dropped the noise floor because of that. So when all that information that is not of interest to us mixes with all the information that is of interest to us, it raises that noise floor. And you can see, so the, the height below those yellow lines, you can see the difference in the noise floor here. Maybe this is clearer. So this is the same shot with and without the bandpass filters. And you can see that we've knocked that noise floor down by 12 dB. So that's basically the same as if you were to move your antenna from 100 feet away from your transmitter to 25 feet, because it's not always possible to do that. So you, have to, you always have to work around what you've got. So this is one way to eliminate a lot of outside junk from T-Mobile, from LED lighting, from video walls, from all kinds of stuff that we don't want. It never gets into our receiver. So we're making our receiver work a whole lot easier because it doesn't have as many things it has to think about. So some other things that you can do to help improve your range, if range is really your problem, is to make sure that your line of sight is clear. Typically, the best place to put antennas is just overhead height. You can have them too high. Antennas are kind of dead underneath them. 
So if you mount your antenna off the ceiling or up on truss or something like that, directly underneath your antenna, you, you lose a lot of potential pickup. I should also mention that you don't really want to hang your antenna on lighting truss. Antennas don't like to be up against metal, especially like a whip antenna or something, an omnidirectional antenna mounted on truss. The metal causes capacitive reactants. There's a bunch of bad things that happen. So you try to avoid having your antennas mounted anywhere near metal. Likewise, if you were to have a, a, a large metal stage piece on stage, if your, if your performer gets very near that big piece of metal, all kinds of funny things start happening. So you want to try to avoid that. You want to have fewer antennas than more antennas. If your system still is just using the little whip antennas on all the receivers, and you've got all those receivers piled together on the same desk, you're losing a lot of potential. Antennas interfere with each other. They, they cause noise. They detune things. Bad stuff happens when you get antennas close together. If you have to have antennas close together, uh, we'd like them to be at least one wavelength apart. In the US, that roughly means two feet. So if you've got eight little receivers with their little whips at two feet apart, you're going to need an awfully large desk. The correct way to do that is with a distro. And uh, another thing you want to avoid is anything that, that radiates EMI. You, you don't want a laptop sitting right on top of your radio rack if your antennas are very close to that. You sure don't want a walkie-talkie or a security radio because they're even higher power. And very close to an antenna, they can obliterate your radio. So you want to make sure that, that those kind of things, if you have comms or something, that you keep them as far away as possible from your antennas. So again, you know, with common sense, range, is, range itself is rarely an issue. And the other thing I should say about that, with radios in general, you don't want more power. That may be your, your thought. Gee, I'll just turn the power up on my radio or I'll get a more powerful transmitter. If you're using multiple radios, they interfere with each other. And the more power there is, the more they interfere with each other. So, and they, you know, they eventually get into your audio and create noise. So you never want more than what you need. With audio systems, yeah, you buy a thousand watt amplifier, you run it at a hundred watts, and we call that headroom. That's a good thing. That keeps your system clean. But with a radio system, when you use more power than you need, when you hit 101%, you're going backwards. You don't have headroom, you're losing headroom. So you never want more power than you need. If your radios are now on full power or your IEMs are on full power, try it at half power. If it still works, if you're still lighting up your, your meter on your radio, that's a better place to leave it. You will have less interference. You will be able to use more radios together, more channels together. So that's just a little quick tip. Okay, second thing is multipath. If you remember analog television, uh, we used to get ghosts for those old enough to remember. <laughs> anyway, uh, that just means that you're getting multiple signals to your radio. The signal is bouncing off things and uh, you're getting multiple hits. In a very simplified form, uh, this is pretty easy to see your signal is being transmitted, and especially it's bouncing off of every piece of metal in your building. So what happens is your nice clean signal is arriving at your radio with like a, a bunch of pool balls that have bounced off the, the cushions and getting there late. And every time they bounce off a piece of metal, they invert polarity. So you know, if you look at these two uh, sine waves at the bottom, if you were to add those two things together, they would add to zero because they are out of polarity with each other. And so you need to avoid reflective surfaces. This is usually pretty much out of your control because you're not going to take down steel girders, but this is happening to your radio. And uh, we have a solution that'll, that'll help with that. So multipath is, is pretty much inevitable. If you are working in a Quonset hut with a metal roof, or you're working in the boys' locker room, that is a very tough condition to do radio, and your range will be shortened. 
So just keep that in mind as you go. But here's the third reason, and this is the one that, that most people aren't very aware of, and this is called polarization crossfade. Now, polarization of antennas is not polarity. Polarity is, is your electrical signal plus and minus. Polarization of antennas has to do with how the signal transmits um, from your transmitter and, and how it's received by your antenna on your receiver. And you need to align these two antennas so that the power from the transmitter is as fully absorbed by your receiving antenna as it possibly can be. So let me show you some things that happen. Again, very simplified because we got to count all those bounces and everything, but just to kind of do it straightforward. The optimum transmission is when your transmitting and, and uh, receiving antennas are in parallel with each other. So if we start with this uh, illustration, uh, you're holding your wireless microphone up and down, maybe the way an announcer would, and the two meters on the side with the two antennas uh, would be your A and B diversity channels of your receiver. So when you hold your microphone straight up and down, and your antennas are straight up and down, that's the maximum efficiency that your receiving antennas will pick up your transmitter. So in this case, if we zero out our meters, uh, we're getting full power in both the A and B channel of our receivers. In almost every receiver, you're only looking at one at a time. So your receiver is going to switch to either the A channel or the B channel. There's a few systems that combine them, but, but in generally speaking, it switches back and forth to the, to, to the signal that it, that it sees best. Okay, so now, as you're holding that microphone, if you were to move that microphone to 45 degrees, the signal coming out of the transmitter isn't hitting the antennas as well. It's missing a little bit. And in this case, at 45 degrees, we would expect the power to drop by 3 dB. Now that's probably not a big problem unless you're on the ragged edge of everything else. If you're already, if you're that close, you're, you need to set your system up better because uh, you, you, need, you need more stability than that. But in the case of our, of our standard radio receiver, a 3 dB down on either antenna uh, is a very good signal and you're good to go. Your receiver is going to pick one or the other of those channels and it's, um, it's gonna go. But here's, here's the bad thing. Now, if you hold that microphone completely horizontal, it's transmitting up and down. And in this case, you would be losing 21 dB in both your A and B channels, right? So that's 1 128th of the power of your transmitter is being accepted by your antennas. And in this case, I would fully expect your radio to drop out. Now, I must say, you're also getting reflections, so other signals may get there, but your direct best signal is, is severely hampered. And so, you know, when people hold microphones, they're going to be moving them around and around. In this case, because your antennas are no longer lined up with your transmitter, you have severe loss of reception. So we make this antenna that's called the diversity fin. And this antenna is a solution to polarization crossfade. So let me show you how this one works. So when you hook this antenna up, if you look at your A and B channels, you've got 100% acceptance by one antenna, but the other antenna is 21 dB down. Not a problem, your, your diversity receiver just simply switches over to your good antenna. That's what diversity is supposed to do, right? So you're good to go all day long. Same way, if you go to 45 degrees, you're 3 dB down in your A and B antennas, okay? But the, again, this is good to go, not a problem. And this is the worst case a diversity fin can be. So I'll show you why. When you switch to the 90 degrees where you were dead on two sides, with your regular antennas, you are completely dead with one. Actually, 
That shouldn't say go on minus 21. That shouldn't be there. But you're, you're very clear on the B channel and it'll just switch over. So as you, as you are moving around a room um, and the polarity is uh, flipping from bouncing off stuff and the polarization has been affected by movement, you're gonna get some changes. Shot a little video here. That here we're using a Shure ULXD. And as you see, watch the diversity lights go back and forth between A and B as we simply twist the microphone. This is, the, this is what you absolutely expect. It's going to go back and forth to A and B as, as you move your microphone sideways. But let me show you what happens here as you, as you move around in the real world a little bit. So here we're going to hold that microphone straight up and down, and uh, we're walking around our lab. Again, watch the A and B light switch on your receiver. Now, in this case, we're not moving the microphone. This is polarization uh, changes that are caused by reflections. So that multipath kind of thing for the signal is changing polarity. But this antenna switches based on polarity, not on RF signal strength, right? So your, your receiver can use either thing. It doesn't care. It, it, can use, it can use polarity or it can use signal strength. But when you move, when, when you uh, switch with polarization, uh, you, you eliminate some of that, uh, some of that multipath as well. So you're not going to get polarization dropouts. I mean, they're, you know, parts per billion. It's not going to happen. Um, here's a DFIN. I guess we were using this one at Indianapolis Raceway. So this antenna, this antenna solves that polarization issue and minimizes the effect of multipath. Now, hopefully your receivers are good at, at avoiding both of those things, but there's a point at which they run out of gas and this one just goes much, much farther. So it's an easy way you know, just swap this antenna out for a pair of whips or a pair of shark fins or whatever you got, and you will greatly improve those things. So there's one more thing that we need to talk about when we're talking about polarization, and that IEMs. Most IEM receivers have only a single antenna. They are not diversity receivers. Uh, there are a few, but not many. They're extremely expensive. So what you're looking at is you have a single antenna. We go back to those pictures where the, uh, the performer is moving the microphone up and down, but the antennas are steady. The same thing happens if you move the receiving antenna, but the transmitting antenna is, is stationary, okay? So as you put a belt pack on and your performer walks around the room, he's gonna be bending, he's gonna be twisting, he's gonna be getting multi-path, all, all that stuff. So anyway, the solution for this when you don't have a diversity radio receiver is to use a helical antenna. This is our CP beam. If you're not familiar with this, you've probably seen this on the sidelines of football games. It's that coil, big coil, uh, wrapped around a piece of plexiglass and a, and a, a dome behind it. Um, that's kind of a big, ugly piece to move around. But what this antenna does, this antenna in, inside the uh, package there, is a corkscrew and it is transmitting in 360 degrees so we don't care how the how the receiver antenna is oriented because it can only be 360 degrees it doesn't matter whether your performer is laying down on his back standing up straight bending over twisting turning moving this antenna pretty much completely negates that problem by sending out the radio wave as a spiral. So it's constantly moving uh, 360 degrees and it's spinning at the basically the speed of light. It's fast. So you don't have to worry about you know falling in between that. This is our solution. It's called a CP beam. This is what you need to be using, a helical antenna for your in-ear system. If you're using a shark fin or you're using a whip, you are really handicapping the ability of your system to perform the way you expect it to. So I uh, highly recommend that you, uh, that you change that over if, uh, if that indeed is the case.
And so that's that's basically the three reasons that a a system that once it's set up, you know, we we're not talking about batteries dying and all that stuff that you know about. This is you've got your system set up. This is what is going to happen to you in the middle of a show that you have to be better than. You have to keep that carrier to noise ratio higher. So if it's dropping out because of polarization, that means your carrier signal is getting weaker and weaker. The noise floor stays the same. So you're, you're losing that carrier to noise ratio. Along with some of the other things that you've, uh, that you've done there to try to improve this. So if you keep these, these three things in mind uh, when you're doing your show, uh, this will help you stay on the air. So with that, we are to the question and answer.